In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. This past week, my wife was out of town again. She has been traveling to Georgia for business. She left last Sunday afternoon, and she returned late Friday night. And when she travels, life for me seems to become a little more hectic. Because in addition to my duties here at the church, my duties at home double, it seems, every time she leaves town. And it's during these weeks when she travels that I find my stress level rises just a little bit. And I find that my patience level is just a little less than it normally is. And I find that my temperature boiling point is also a little less than it is. And I tend to get angry a little more easy. And I find that my mind is much more scattered than it usually is. Usually on weeks like these, when she's gone for that extended period of time, and she's away, I feel like I'm in overdrive mode. And I feel like my head is pointed down, driving, focusing only on what I need to do in order to make it through that single day. And some days are very, very difficult. And it seems to me that on, during these times when I'm so focused on just what needs to get done and there's so much that has to get done, that I miss out on a lot of the beauty of the things going on around me that I usually notice and that I'm usually able to pick up on. And I also, I confess to you, find myself full of self-pity and feeling sorry for myself that I have so much to do and that my, double, my duties have doubled. And I was reminded of this very point and it hit me like a lightning bolt last Friday. On Friday morning, the last, on the day that my wife was to come home in the evening, my daughter Kirana, she's seven years old, her parents dropped her off early so that I could take her to school. And so I was scattering around the house and we had this extra person who I don't know very well in our home, but she's a sweet little girl. And so I asked Kirana, and I asked this little girl, her name's Nina, to come walk with me. Um, we're going to go walk the dog before I take you to school. So we went out for a little walk, and the, the second my head was down and I had the dog leash in my hand and I had these two little girls coming with me and I'm just taking care of business, stressing about what else I have for that day. And this little girl, Nina, immediately, as soon as we walked out the front door, said, oh my gosh, look up in the sky, there's a huge cross. And I said, what? And I looked up, and here was this beautiful cross stretching as far as I can see north and south, and as far as I could see east and west across the sky. I think it was the, from two jets that had crossed, but it was just huge, and it just stayed there and on an otherwise perfectly clear morning. But this little girl noticed this. I don't even know if she's a Christian or not. I think she comes from Indian background. But she saw this cross up there in the sky. And as I looked up and saw that giant cross casting its shadow down upon this earth, it was almost as if heaven itself was speaking to me directly and reminding me of where my true focus needs to be in life. Because when my wife's out of town, I seem to be out of focus. This past week on Wednesday, September 14th, we celebrated the elevation of the holy, blessed, and life-giving cross. And we remembered that day 1,700 years ago when the Emperor Constantine sent his mother down to Jerusalem to find that life-giving cross because he had been given a vision in a dream. And she went down to Jerusalem 
and looked for that cross and had a hard time interviewing a lot of people, but was ultimately led to Golgotha, where Christ was crucified. And there, under rubbles, of, under this, uh, this rubble and this um, broken uh, temple, um, a pagan temple, they started digging. And soon they came upon three crosses. The two crosses of the thief that Christ was crucified next to, and the cross itself, and by two miracles, they were able to discover that that truly was the cross, because a woman was healed, and actually um, an individual was raised from the dead when that cross was in their midst. So the people of Jerusalem were full of joy on that day, and the patriarch of Jerusalem took that cross into the temple and held it high above his head so that everybody could see it and everybody could rejoice that the true cross of Christ was discovered. And that day a lot of people were baptized and the church grew and there was so much gladness. And on the, in the gospel lesson that we read on that day, on Wednesday, on September 14th, it's always the same, we heard the story of when Jesus was judged and when Jesus was beaten and when Jesus was tortured and when he was sentenced to carry that very cross to that place where he would be crucified and to where they would kill him as he hung on that cross right in front of his own mother and right in front of the Apostle John. The cross at that time meant something very different. The cross at that time meant crucifixion, and it meant death, because it was the sign and it was used for capital punishment. And we know that Jesus died on that cross next to those two thieves, and he was also, who were also there being sentenced for their crime. But we also remember on that day, the day of the Holy Cross, what Christ did for us. He died for us, willingly, so that he could literally defeat sin, which he did not create, and that he could defeat death, which he didn't understand, and that he could defeat, defeat Satan, the angel that fell from grace, and that he could rise three days later, paving the way for us to one day be reunited with him in the kingdom of heaven. So that cross, which in those days was a symbol of death, because of what Jesus Christ did, now becomes a symbol of life to us and a symbol of love to us and a symbol of hope to us, a symbol of joy and a symbol, as Father George said so eloquently at a wedding yesterday, a symbol of victory. And just as Jesus was sentenced to carry his own cross to that place of Golgotha where he would be crucified, we learn in the Gospel lesson this morning, the very first sentence said that we too are called to carry, to deny ourselves, and to carry our own cross and to follow him. And so what does that mean, to deny ourselves and to carry that cross? In the book of Matthew, Christ is very clear what that means. He said that to, to, not, to deny yourself is to give food to the hungry when you have some and they don't. It's to give a stranger some company. It's to give somebody who has no place to live a place to take shelter. It's when you see somebody that's in need of clothing to help cover their body so that they can stay warm. It's when you see somebody in prison to go visit them and bring them some sense of hope. And it's when you see somebody sick to go visit them 
and to tell them that God loves them. That's what it means to carry your own cross. And so the weight of our own personal cross, in a real sense, is the excess weight that we willingly bear to lessen the load of our fellow brothers and sisters. Because just like a ship that's bearing a heavy load is less disturbed by the turbulent sea, the heavier our load, or the more that we deny ourselves to serve our fellow man, the less likely that we will be blown off the path that we Christians are trying to navigate for ourselves, the path of righteousness. And so as I looked up at the sky and saw that beautiful cross that this little girl pointed, had to point out to me, I realized that I had nothing to be to pity myself for. I had nothing to be sad for. And that my own self-pity and my own sadness was my own arrogance because it's truly a blessing to have been given everything that I've been given, to have the opportunity to be here to serve next to Father George and to not only help for the care, help with the cares of and to the, the needs of this particular parish, but also to have a double portion of the opportunity to care for my very own family. Today, during Orthros, there was a hymn that was read in honor of this day. And I want to conclude with this, because as we began church school this year, and as we begin another church calendar year, and as we struggle with so many things, especially some recent things that have happened here in this community over the last several weeks and couple of months, and they'll keep continuing to happen, as we struggle with our lives, this particular hymn might bring us into focus to help us understand what this cross can do for us if we truly do desire to deny ourselves and take it up for ourselves and follow Christ. The hymn says, Rejoice, O cross of the Lord. Through thee mankind has been delivered from the curse, shattering the enemy by thy exaltation. O cross, all venerable, Thou art a sign of true joy to us. Thou art our help. Thou art the strength of kings, the power of righteous men, the majesty of priests, all who sign themselves with this cross are freed from all peril. And we truly believe that. Thou rod of strength, under which we, like sheep, are tended. Thou art a weapon of peace, round which the angels stand in fear. Thou art the divine glory of Christ, who grants the world great mercy. The cross is truly the preserver of our universe. The cross is the peace and the calmliness of the church. The cross truly is the might for all of us. And the cross is the steadfastness of all believers. Because the cross is not only the glory for us, but the glory of all those in heaven, the angels, and at the same time, the sting of Satan. May the Holy Cross be a comfort for all of you. And may the Holy Cross and Christ's grace shine within each one of you as we begin another church year and as we remember what that cross and what Christ transformed that cross for our lives is. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.